And it's my pleasure, along with Chris Johnson, to welcome you to our joint symposium today on China-Taiwan-United uh, States relations. Um, we're now almost at the um, five-year point of uh, Ma Ying-jeou's presidency. Uh, we're about at the two-month point of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, total assumption of uh, of his various positions that uh, add up to being the paramount leader. Um, and so this seemed like a good time to assess where cross-strait relations and the American role are. Um, we've uh, assembled uh, um, three good panels on various aspects of these issues. And um, I think we're going to have a really good discussion. Um, before I... Um, sort of leave the stage, I want to uh, express my appreciation to the people who really made this happen, and uh, that's the staff of uh, two organizations, um, Kevin Scott um, on, and uh, Aileen Chang um, on my staff, and uh, at the Freeman Chair, um, Nicole White uh, did Yo Person's Duty. Um, uh, to help pull this all together. And uh, Chris and I appreciate their efforts uh, very much. So without further ado, Chris. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'll just be very brief. Uh, thank you all for coming. We really appreciate uh, folks coming out, and I think the, uh, the turnout in the room is a good indicator that uh, we picked a good topic today and that there's very strong continuing interest in cross-strait relations. When I first talked to Richard about doing this, uh, we both agreed that uh, with all of the other many issues that are kind of circulating and are the focus of attention in the region these days uh, with the various island disputes and now again with North Korea and so on, we both sort of thought that it would be a helpful time to take a little step back and look at uh, U.S., Taiwan, China, triangular relations and to get a sense of where it's all going now that we've had a complete turnover uh, in all the respective leaderships and uh, are moving forward, you know, in all of the, all of the key teams uh, moving ahead. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is uh, welcome our first panel to come up and uh, we'll get started on a very fruitful discussion. Thank you again for coming and uh, we'll get going here. Thanks. Okay, well, let me uh, just do a brief introduction <coughs> of, our, of our speakers today, and um, we will uh, get things kicked off here. <coughs> We're going to ask uh, uh, Yun Sun to come up and, and uh, kick us off with a discussion of China. She's a visiting uh, fellow jointly appointed by the Brookings John L. Thornton Center and the Africa Growth Initiative, and she's focusing on China's relations with Africa and U.S.-China cooperation on the continent. In 2011, she was a visiting fellow with the Brookings Center for Northeast Asia Policy Studies, where she focused on analysis of China's national security decision-making system. So that's why we've asked her to come and talk to us today. She was previously a visiting fellow with the East Asia Program at the Stimson Center. And prior to that, she was a China analyst for the International Crisis Group's Northeast Asia Project based in Beijing. Uh, her expertise is in Chinese domestic and foreign policy and U.S.-China relations. And she served in a bunch of very prestigious uh, past uh, appointments. Uh, secondly, we're going to have Emerson Neo, uh, a professor of political science at Duke University, come and talk to us about Taiwan. Uh, he's the co-author of Balance of Power, uh, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 1989, and has a series of uh, other recent publications that you can see from his biography uh, in your packet. And then we're going to ask uh, Tom Mann to come up and, uh, and bat clean up uh, and try to explain our own mess <laughs> here in Washington to us. And uh, he is the W. Averill Harriman Chair and Senior Fellow in Government Studies at the Brookings Institution. And between 1987 and 1999, he was Director of Governmental Studies at Brookings. And before that, he was Executive Director of the American Political Science Association. He's taught at Princeton, uh, Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, the University of Virginia, and a few other very prestigious institutions. So we're very honored to have him with us today, and we're looking forward to a good discussion. So without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Yun Sun to come up and kick us off. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Chris, for the great, gracious introduction. And thanks to um, Brookings Synapse and CSIS to, uh, for inviting me here to be today. Um, well, I'm going to, my talk is going to focus on two aspects of the Chinese new leader. One is the domestic politics, what are the new things that Xi Jinping has delivered so far. And then I'm going to focus on the foreign policy front. What are the new developments that we have observed since he's, uh, he's taking over the power as a top Chinese leader? So it has been almost six months since Xi Jinping was elected the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party at the 18th Party's Congress, and more than a month since his inauguration as China's new president. Given his personal background as a princeling, his experience during the Cultural Revolution, and his record of gradually rising to the highest office in China through climbing the bureaucratic ladder, people have had great hopes for him to bring changes to the existing system. The expectation was heightened and strengthened by the senior level scandals before the end of the Hu Jintao administration in, uh, in 2011 and 2012. So there was an ensuing perception that the Chinese Communist Party regime has come to a point that it has to adapt and change. So the Chinese also have an old saying that a new official must start his reign with something new. So perhaps we could start with an examination on the new things that Xi Jinping has created in the uh, domestic politics. So most importantly, Xi Jinping has strived to create a new style of the government that is low profile, frugal, pragmatic, and pro the people. Right after the 18th Party's Congress, Xi Jinping took the first official inspection tour to Shenzhen in Guangdong province in December. For the trip, unlike his predecessors, Xi Jinping ordered that there would be no red carpets, no extravagant banquets, no massive security preparations, and no traffic control during his visit. Mm -hmm. For the Chinese people who are used to, to the long speeches of the top leaders, extensive welcoming ceremonies, including children presenting flowers, massive traffic due to the block, the road blockage, Xi's new style sends a tacit but powerful message of major differences between him and the previous generations of leaders. So Xi has made the, um, secondly, Xi has made anti-corruption a top priority for his government. This echoes people's resentment and frustration for, of the epidemic corruption of the government officials across the country. She made a famous vow to strike both the flies and tigers, referring to corrupted officials both on the grass, grassroots level and on the senior level. And there have been several dozens of officials removed, investigated, arrested for corruption since she took office. A large percentage of these officials, they are the municipal level or the department level in the central um, government bureaucracy in terms of their ranking. So the highest case was the deputy party secretary of the Sichuan province, Li, Chun, Li Chuncheng, who was also an alternate member of the central committee of the Chinese Communist Party. So that is to say the strike, the anti-corruption campaign under Xi has reached some senior, senior level people, but it has not reached the, uh, the top level. So some people will argue that this, uh, this corruption is not genuine or not meaningful unless it really targets and um, deals with uh, official uh, the corruption on the top level. But the scale and the results of his anti-corruption campaign still is rather unprecedented in the, uh, in the Chinese domestic politics. As a part of the anti-corruption campaign, she made frugality a primary requirement for the government officials. As the government bans fancy banquets and extravagant high-priced traditional Chinese liquor, high-end <laughs> restaurants and liquor industry in China are taking a major hit. So, the, for example, the high-end restaurant industry in Beijing in general has seen the first negative growth in decades. And some of the restaurants even have experienced a loss as high as 50%, 50%. And hotels such as Shangri-La, which I'm sure many of you have stayed there, um, resorted to developing new menus to, cr to cater to the new reality, offering $15 per person lunch option to the government agencies. But still, so far, it has not attracted a lot of, um, a lot of businesses. <laughs> Uh, since taking office, she has inspected several PLA segments inside China. In December last year, he inspected the Guangzhou military region, which is, uh, which is under the army. In February, he visited the Air Force Base in western China. And earlier this month, he visited the PLA Naval Force Base in Sanya of Hainan province. So some argue that these trips were aimed at consolidating his control of the Chinese military. However, um, a key message that Xi Jinping has sent throughout these visits 
is that the Chinese military must be ready for combat, which is rather interesting. And given the uh, challenging external environment that China faces in this uh, periphery, um, people in China generally see this as an emphasis on the new leader's emphasis on the military pre preparedness for the worst case scenario. So these new policies by Xi Jinping has been relatively well received by the general public in China. People seem to accept that she has created a new governance style, distinguishing himself from the previous generations of leaders. The expectation is genuine and high for him to address some of the most critical problems facing the Chinese people, such as a high housing price, pollution, and the rampant corruption issue. And so far, people do not seem to be disappointed already. Um, the relatively clean record of Xi's family members, the good image of his wife, all contributed to this positive outlook. As for whether she will bring the major changes to the system, such as political democratization, there are critics questioning whether she is only making cosmetic changes to the system rather than addressing the core issue. So the first controversy he had experienced was Southern Weekly, uh, which is a Chinese publication from Guangzhou. Uh, it was Southern Weekly's uh, New Year's edition calling for constitutionalism and how the censorship by the Department of Propaganda distorted the or original story, hindering the freedom of information and free press. The Guangdong, Guangdong government was able to mediate a compromise in the end between the Southern Weekly and the Department of Propaganda, but she himself didn't seem to have played a major role in the resolution of this controversy. Then, following the, uh, the, controver the controversial issue, there were rampant hopes that she might signal bigger changes by releasing Liu Xiaobo, by readdressing the Tiananmen event of uh, 1989, or even by, abolish, by the abolishment of the notorious re-education through labor program in China. But so far, none of this has happened. And in my personal view, these are unlikely to happen in the near future, because today's Chinese politics is still characterized with different political uh, factions, collective decision making, and the wide existence of interest groups and political conservatism. So despite Xi Jinping's new style and his seemingly stronger power base compared to his predecessor, Xi by himself is still subject to the various constraints inside, Chine inside China. Especially as a new leader of the party, he could hardly afford to alienate either the leftist or the rightist since the very beginning. In addition, in the near future, Xi Jinping also has more pressing tasks to tackle. Um, on the foreign policy front, there are some more interesting developments. First of all, on the U.S. with uh, on, on the relationship with the United States, China seems to be more cooperative and conciliatory than before. But I'll listen to the expert advice from the uh, from Chris. Um, as after the tense and contentious past three to four years, China, according to the people that I know in inside China, China has come to the realization that such a confrontational posture is neither is neither sustainable nor conducive to China's national interest. So therefore, since the beginning of the new Xi administration, Beijing has been eager to turn a new page of the U.S.-China relations, or in Xi's own words, to build a new type of big power uh, relations. Understanding that China would need to deliver something concrete to open that new page, China has chosen to be more cooperative on a key concern of the United States in the Northeast Asia, which is North Korea. In the most recent round of nuclear tests and rhetorical provocations by Pyongyang, China has moderately adjusted its policy, lending support to the UN Security Council resolution and putting more pressure on Pyongyang than before. It is reported that China cut crude oil supplies to North Korea in February, possibly as a punishment for its nuclear test. Authorities in Beijing also issued warnings to several North Korean banks to operate within their per permitted limits inside China. Although we are suspicious that these were more tactical moves aimed at, a, at building a better U.S.-China relations rather than representing a strategic shift of China's fundamental position on North Korea, still they would nevertheless prove how Turn, turn out to be helpful to manage the tension on the Korean Peninsula. On a similar case of the Iran nuclear issue, China's action has also been promising. In 2012, China's crude import from Iran dropped by 21% compared with the previous year. So although we probably will never get Chinese officials to acknowledge that China was actually complying to the U.S. sanction on Iran for its nuclear program, nevertheless, the end result does, does reinforce Washington's policy targets. 
The aspiration for a new page of the U.S.-China relations was also conspicuous during uh, Secretary of State John Kerry's visit to Beijing last week. Many in China have blamed the problems of U.S.-China relations in the past three to four years on the positions and styles of the former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and therefore there was a hope that a mo more moderate and pragmatic John Kerry would be good news for China. And indeed, the conclusion in Beijing is that he is. Um, for Chinese foreign policy analysts, the U.S. rebalancing to Asia was mostly, had been mostly about a um, um, enhanced military deployment in China's immediate periphery and surprising China's expanding geopolitical influence. So therefore, when Kerry emphasized the U.S. economic leadership, competitiveness, and TPP, it was particularly comforting and reassuring for China. So Global Times, the famous government mouthpiece, openly claimed that U.S. adjustment of its China policy eases China's anxiety about its external strategic environment in the past few years. For Beijing, a new era of an improved U.S.-China relations seems to have begun. Another interesting development of Xi's foreign policy is the emphasis on the developing countries and its neighbors. So for his uh, first overseas visit, she visited Russia, three African countries, and attended the uh, BRICS summit in South Africa. So as usual, um, she brought packages of infrastructure projects, and um, un which unusually, uh, China committed to the establishment of a BRICS development bank, modeled after the China Development Bank. The choices of that nation actually review the international quagmire that China is in. The past 10 years, so basically the 10 years during the, uh, the Hu Jintao administration, witnessed unprecedented growth of Chinese economy, but it was also accompanied by unparalleled, unparalleled foreign policy challenges. So as many Chinese um, Chinese analysts observed China's external environment did not improve as a result of China's rise. Instead, it has worsened. China has become richer, but less respected. It has more transactions with the world than ever, but also less friends. So therefore, Xi's trip to Russia, to Africa, and the BRICS summit genuinely reflects China's strategic moves to break away from this predicament. It seeks to reconsolidate friendship with Russia, also antagonized antagonized by the West, with Africa to reinforce China's developing country's identity and the solidarity with the developing world and with emerging economies such as BRICS nation to align for their collective power. China learned its lessons that it is yet to be strong enough to challenge the international, existing international order alone, alignment with other rising powers, like in the case of BRICS, and reinforcing its friendship base among developing countries would be a new emphasis of China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping in the, new, in the, foreseeable, in the foreseeable future. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. That's a great way to kick off. And uh, Emerson, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. I have uh, prepared some slides to share with you. And the theme today I'm going to talk about is the China factor in Taiwanese politics. All right, I'm going to focus on uh, three aspects of this question. And actually, I will <laughs> focus uh, mainly on the first one, uh, the, main, you know, the views in Taiwan um, on how Taiwan should approach and engage China. And the second one is fairly easy. You know, what, what do Taiwanese want? Taiwanese want security, prosper prosperity, and dignity. So that's easy to answer. The third one, I'm going to uh, ask your help, right? Because either I will run out of time before I get to that, or because you are more experienced than I am in that area. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. Um, to talk about the main views in Taiwan, right? We, I use survey data. Why? Because Taiwan is a democracy. All right? We need to know what the people want. All right? So probably you won't uh, hear me talking about what my angel thinks. I don't know. All right? But I can tell you what Taiwanese voters, they think, they want. All right? and, and I've been doing uh, surveys on, on this topic since 2003. And I have six survey data sets. And they are open to the public. All right? Uh, so we can talk about uh, how you can obtain this data later. All right, let's move on. Well, first, some, some softball questions, right? We ask Taiwanese, how do you like Americans? How do you like, not Americans, do you, the United States, Japan, China, all right? So sure, you know, on average, Taiwanese feel the warmest toward the United States, all right? 
Japan second and China last. But we can extract more information right, from these questions. You know, we can find out how much, there's no point to it. Right? Like, who ranked USA first? A means America, right? Who ranked um, you know, USA first, China second, Japan last? All right, who ranked uh, American first, Japan second, China last? All right, so we can have a preference rankings given these three scores, all right? And so, uh, well, so you can see that uh, USA is ranked at the top by many uh, respondents. And Japan, is, and chi you know, China is, uh, well, we can take, take a look at this uh, more aggregate uh, statistics. Right. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to fall. But here you can see that uh, X means, say, United States. Use United States a, as an example, right? 28% uh, of the respondents rank the United States at the top, all right? And to about 25% uh, rank the United States at the top, but, but the U.S. shared the first position with any other country, all right? And uh, about 10% rank the U.S. at the bottom, right? And you can see that in Taiwan, among these three countries, all right, China is ranked at the bottom by more than 50% of the respondents. All right, so at least in Taiwan, among these three countries, all right, uh, Taiwanese feel the least warmest toward China and the most warmest toward the United States. All right? And also, uh, you know, we, we all know that Taiwan and China have very strong ties. But just give you some statistics, right? And I, I, I think this is amazing. More than 40% of the eligible voters in Taiwan have visited China, all right? Many of them, about 20% of them have visited China more than three times, right? And since 2003, the, the increase is about 10 to 15% of increase of visits, right? And also, how many people in your family it's doing business in China, 16%. That's a huge number, all right? Among the eligible voters, about one-sixth of them have family members doing business in China, all right? Let's say a rough estimate is one million businessmen in China. Each person's income affects a whole household's uh, livelihood. On average, that's about three votes. All right, so that's three million votes. And Taiwan has about 12 million eligible, uh, eligible votes. That's a quarter of the eligible votes are related to personal business, employment you know, in China. So that's a huge number, right? And um, well, the statistics I obtained from the Statistics Bureau shows you the trade between China and Taiwan, you know, just Amazing, you know, last year it hit $169 billion. Give you a uh, reference point. The U.S. and Germany's total trade last year was only less than that, $158 billion. The largest economy and the, third, and, and the fourth largest economy, the total trade between them is 158 But the trade between Taiwan and China is 169 All right. And... Um, 132 means Taiwan's export to China, and 32 means uh, China's export to Taiwan. So you can see that Taiwan's economy really depends on China, right? More than 20% of Taiwan's export goes to China, and only about 4% of China's export uh, goes to uh, Taiwan, right? All right, so of course you ask uh, Taiwanese, do they worry about the strong trade relation with China? So we say, hey, you know, some people believe that if Taiwan's economy overly depends on China, then China might use its economic leverage to coerce Taiwan to make political concession. Do you agree with this view? Right? Two thirds of them agree. They, 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 they have this worry, All right? This economic leverage can be used to, for political purpose, right? But then you ask them, do you want to trade more with China? 
56% say, yeah, we, 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 we need to trade even more with China. All right? So on the one hand, they worry about China using its economy leverage. On the other hand, they feel the necessity you know, to expand trade further with China. Right? That's like a conundrum for a, a small power. <laughs> it's like, gee, they don't want to be coerced, but, but <laughs> sometimes they just have to do it. <laughs> uh, and, of, and when we talk about Taiwan, you know, Taiwan independence, this issue is uh, in, you know, unavoidable. But we know that most people in Taiwan want to maintain the status quo. Right? But that's prime then, see, under what conditions they will move away from the status quo, all right? According to other statistics, uh, surveys, they show you 90% of the Taiwanese want to maintain the status quo. All right, let's ask them, well, when, under what condition you will move away from the status quo, right? Toward independence and toward unification, right? So some hypothetical questions, right? So if, um, Declaration of independence by Taiwan will cause China to attack Taiwan. Do you, in Chinese, it's zan bu zan chen. All right, it's like, do you favor, um, I, I, what, that might be the closest translation I can come up. Favor Taiwan independence, all right? So majority of them don't favor Taiwan independence, if it means war, all right? But if you ask them, if uh, a declaration of independence by Taiwan will not cause China to attack Taiwan, do you favor independence? Then 70% say, yeah, that's, that's go for it, all right? So you can see the switch. So, so those missiles deployed along the Fujian province, you know, the take home point say, God, those missiles really work, <laughs> all right? Clearly deter a lot of Taiwanese, all right? So we can use these two questions to divide the um, respondents into mainly three categories. Those who answer yes, to those, both questions, you know, under no, you know, un, at any cost, I will support independence. And no, yes means I will only support independence if there's no war. All right, so they are conditional. Right? We don't want war. But if there's no war, then I will, I, I'm, I'm willing to support it. And these uh, respondents, they do not want, they, they do not accept independence at any cost. They don't care whether it means war or no war, all right? So we, we can divide, uh, classify respondents in, into those three groups, all right? So you can see that a lot of respondents are in this conditional preference, have conditional preferences, all right, in that category. Um, in, you know, since 2003 to 2012, we, you know, we conducted six surveys. You can see that those in the middle group, the, those who have conditional preferences, stay fairly constant. But what happened in the last two years? All right, because clearly, those who say no decrease. All right, those who say yes increase by at least five, six percent points. Right. Remember, yes means those strong independent supporters, right? Only if no war is the conditional in independent supporters. No means they don't support independence, all right? And we can do the same um, to the respondents by asking them um, other questions on unification, right? That is, well, hypothetically, again, if there's a you know, significant difference between Taiwan and, and mainland China, right, um, political, economic, and social condition. Do you favor unification? I mean, big difference, right? No, right? 77% say no, we don't want independent, uh, unification that way. But if, if you ask them, hey, if, you know, uh, the two sides, the, the political, economic, and social conditions become more similar, do you favor unification? Then more respondents favor unification, right? But still, under no condition, they will want unification is more than a majority now, all right? Fifty-four percent of the respondents say n under no, no condition, we would uh, support uh, unification. And show you, this is a big shift, all right? Because when we started conducting uh, the survey asking these questions, the percentage was 29 percent. 
over, over the last 10 years, it increased, almost doubled. Right? They switch from conditional to just no, not even maybe. Right? There's no maybe for a majority of the respondents. Right? Now it's a majority of them. Is this trend reversible? Right? It's easy to deter Taiwan from moving toward independence, but it's very difficult to facilitate unification, to win their heart, all right, to have unification. Right. Well, and let's move on a little bit. All right, that's what they want, all right? But we also ask them, um, well, we say uh, some people believe that China and Taiwan will become united in the future, and some people believe that Taiwan, uh, uh, Taiwan will eventually become independent from China. Which position do you agree with more? That is, realistically, do you think that Taiwan can become independent? Or the two sides will become united? All right? What you want, what you, your preference is one thing, but your estimate, your expectation of what will happen in the future is the other thing. All right? Turn out, ignore the bottom part first. Actually, still, a majority of the respondents say unification is more likely to happen. Although majority of them don't want unification, that's another small powers conundrum. They don't want it, but they, they think it's going to happen anyway. All right? 52.7% of the respondents say, hey, unification is more likely to happen. Even those strong independent supporters, the yes, yes, those strong independent supporters, more than one third think unification will happen. All right, those conditional independent supporters, more than more, <coughs> 60, about 60% think that unification will still happen. All right, so their preference tells you something, and their expectation, you know, sends you a different message. All right, so that's something that China can work on. All right, because some, some you know, some things are driving the, the difference between preference and expectation. All right? And we can ignore this for, let's focus on this. <laughs> it shows you how politics sometimes is so beautiful. Yeah. Let's just uh, th those independent supporters. No, no, um, people's uh, position on independence, right? We, we say, okay, ask them the likelihood that independence can be achieved. Uh, 11 point scale, zero to 10. 10 is the most likely, zero is the least likely, all right? The, the green line means those strong independent supporters. Still, most of them don't think, are, are not very optimistic. The Taiwan independence unification issues are the top, you know, the hardest issue in Taiwan. But you ask them, can they be, uh, is it likely to achieve your goal? No. But they still want to fight about it. <laughs> All right? Even Taiwan independ strong independent supporters don't think independence can be achieved, but they still go to the alley, you know, go knock down the door of the justice, uh, the chief, I don't know. But anyway, it's a politics. Politics is beautiful. I mean, it's a anyway, so preference and expectation diverge. All right, I think that there's a, a lot of things, a lot of studies can be done in that area. Right? What's driving the difference? Um, uh, some questions, uh, just to share with you. Um, just let's go over this. So, so uh, what, how to deal with China's uh, military threat? You know? So, Taiwanese, they say, well, let's not confront China. Let's take more moderate policies. All right? That is, let's not have an arms race with China. All right? Very conciliatory. Uh, if China redraws its missile along the southeast coast, do you favor a reduction in arms purchase from the U.S.? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's not provoke China. All right. And do you think our military is capable of defending Taiwan? No. 91% doesn't think that Taiwan's national defense is <laughs> strong enough. All right. Taiwanese voters are just uh, so honest. So, yeah, so they, don't, they don't think Taiwan <laughs> can... Withstand. So do you favor uh, like an interim agreement? Yes, 82%. All right, you can see they are very, uh, and, and uh, okay, it, this is interesting. 
So some people believe that Taiwan is already an independent country. Its name is Republic China, and there's no need to seek further independence. Do you agree or disagree with this view? And uh, about three quarters, yeah. You know, this is a slow increase, uh, all right? Uh, and the, is the current relation between China and Taiwan peaceful or hostile? You know, I only included this question, uh, I started in 2011, so only two, data, you know, two trends. So 2012 compared to 2011, more people think the two sides are more peaceful now. All right, so overall, uh, overall, Taiwanese think that the current relation between China and Taiwan uh, is peaceful, and, and, Taiwan, and Taiwanese are, are very conciliatory and, and try not to be confrontational uh, toward China, right? And, and the, these two questions also on the survey. If Taiwan declares independence, do, do you, their perception, the perception of um, whether China will attack Taiwan, right? Still, 60, more than 60% say yes, but there's a slight, you know, over the years, over the last 10 years, there's a decrease, about 10%. So less, actually less, um, fewer Taiwanese uh, find China's threat cred uh, credible now, right? And how about the U.S. security commitment to Taiwan, right? There's a line missing here. So those who answer yes, those who answer don't know, all right, so the, those who, there's third line is those who answer no, all right. So still, most Taiwanese think the U.S. will come to help Taiwan, all right. But I, 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 when I have time, I will start to play with this, why the, there's a decrease uh, in um, this uncertain the group, all right, that is, um, Fewer Taiwanese are uncertain about the U.S. Secu security commitment now. Okay. So I'll give you a summary, uh, summary of the empirical findings from uh, the, the survey. Uh, uh, the first is bilateral relations um, between China and Taiwan are growing stronger. Right? Although it's growing stronger, but ha somehow Taiwanese feel still low affinity with China. Right? And uh, Taiwan is very conciliatory and not confrontational toward China. And most people, most Taiwanese want to strengthen economic relations with China. But meanwhile, they also worry that, you know, China will um, use its economic leverage. Uh, and, all right, so majority of Taiwanese, all right, it's done. Okay, so, so, so okay, that's done. Just the last three points. Prefer not, you know, majority of them don't want to unite with China, but they think you know, unification is more likely. And, uh, and uh, a lot of respondents have conditional preferences on independence and unification. And well, the last point is uh, the U.S. security commitment uh, becomes more credible in the minds of Taiwanese and uh, China's threat becomes less credible. All right, that's my presentation. Like uh, uh, in, in the Q&A, if you have questions about my presentation, all right, don't ask tough questions. Instead, help formulate some policy ideas, insights, all right? That's the part I don't have time to get to, although I prepare some something, all right? But. My colleagues have been, uh, uh, very uh, informative and very optimistic. Uh, they've set a high standard for anyone who's supposed to talk about American politics. Uh, uh, that is for sure. The, the question I'm going to put in all too brief uh, a time with you this morning is, can the Obama administration conduct an effective foreign policy, especially in Asia, during its second term in light of America's utterly dysfunctional politics? And the answer to stay in the spirit of the panel thus far is yes. Uh, our dysfunctional politics will continue. Uh, it is not morning again in America. The 2012 elections did not transform 
American politics. We do not have the makings of broad bipartisan consensus. Uh, no efforts to charm Republicans by President Obama will make a damn bit of difference, and, uh, uh, nor will uh, additional columns by Maureen Dowd. Uh, uh, the, the fact is we in our domestic politics are, have moved from a permanent campaign to a partisan war, a hot war uh, between between the political parties, uh, which begin in a position of intense ideological polarization, but because they're operating at a rough level of parity, meaning either party can win the White House, can take the majority in the House or the Senate, they act inside Congress in a very strategic fashion. That is, they legislate not to solve problems, but they legislate to gain electoral advantage in the, in the upcoming elections. Uh, we are, in other words, caught in a very unfortunate mismatch between our political parties, which, by the way, the framers of the US Constitution never anticipated, but which have become parliamentary-like, ideologically polarized, internally homogeneous, and acting in a very sort of oppositional mode, just what Madison didn't have in mind. He anticipated the differences, but thought to design a set of institutions and, and incentives for people to engage in serious negotiations uh, across the branch, the, the houses of Congress and across the branches of the executive and, and legislative branches. Yet, the parties exist now in a fashion uh, in, in which the one in the minority um, acts as a vehemently oppositional party, as a parliamentary party would do, but sadly, they operate in a political system that makes it very difficult for majorities to act. So a seniority system that constrained policy making in the past and sometimes brought together agreement between the parties now is a, is a veto point with the routine 60 votes uh, required to, to get anything done as we, we just saw in the effort to pass stricter background checks for the purchase of, uh, of, of weapons, uh, a, very, a very sad outcome. Uh, so you've got parties that are parliamentary, but a governing system that is a separation of powers where majorities are not able to act. The ingredients for, for inaction, for gridlock, uh, uh, and, and for strategic politics. That's the number one problem facing America today. The second problem, and this is the one people don't like to mention in polite company, is that the parties are not equally implicated. Uh, we have what I call asymmetric polarization. Uh, that is to say there were times when it was the Democratic Party who veered uh, off the mainstream, the center of uh, the median voter, if you will, um, in the 60s and 70s. But today, there is no question that it is the Republican Party that has become the radical uh, insurgent force in our politics, ideologically extreme, uh, contemptuous of the inherited policy regime going back all the way to Teddy Roosevelt, scornful of compromise, uh, dismissive of uh, ordinary concerns about facts, evidence uh, of science, and, and basically not accepting of the legitimacy of its, of its political opposition. Um, we've lived through an extraordinary period of manufactured crises of of uh, threats of a public default, of, of a, 
of an almost mindless debate over, over fiscal policy that we're now seeing play out. I have to run off to catch a train, a plane, uh, national airport in a, uh, in a few minutes, and I don't know if there are going to be enough air traffic controllers to allow my flight to get it. Now think about it. We're, we're the greatest country in the world, and look what we're doing. That experience is multiplied hundreds of times around, around the government budget, but a simple agreement to set aside that sequester, which was originally conceived uh, as a fallback that would force agreement uh, on a more rational basis, has failed because Republicans embrace Grover Norquist no new tax pledge. It's as simple as that. A great country cannot govern by having a no new tax pledge. Um, and a party cannot be a constructive participant in policy making if it embraces that. Now, uh, th that is the sorry truth and the sorry state of our, uh, of our politics. We see some green shoots. Uh, Look what's happening with the immigration now, with the Gang of Eight and a serious effort to bring the stakeholders in this debate together. We got unions working with the Chamber of, of Commerce, uh, sort of many other, it's sort of pragmatic, uh, reasonable, problem-solving politics at its best. Well, why is it happening with immigration but not happening on economic policy or gun control? It's very simple. Republicans are worried about becoming politically marginalized in presidential elections for the foreseeable future because every non-white group in America uh, and their share of the electorate is growing with each passing year um, uh, supports the Democratic Party and particularly true with respect to uh, uh, to Latinos, it's, it's even more true, actually, with Asian Americans. Uh, and therefore, Republicans believe that if, if, if they fight a comprehensive immigration reform, they're writing their ticket to political oblivion. So they're giving on this. It's still going to be hard to get through because of the House, but, but it's, a, it's a sign, at least, that under certain circumstances, things... Uh, things can be done. Uh, listen, the reason I'm ending on an optimistic uh, note is, uh, is twofold. Uh, one has to do with the fact that in spite of these dysfunctional politics, we've gotten quite a bit done. Uh, we dealt with a financial crisis and a deep economic recession one way or another. Um, Depending on the Fed at times, other times on unified party government, we've managed to take steps uh, after exploring all other alternatives that would actually be constructive. And, and we're frankly doing a lot better than Europe. Uh, we've avoided the, the, the most mindless of austerity uh, strategies, but not without a fight here and the efforts to pursue such strategies as witnessed by the sequester uh, continue. But the, the fact is sentiment is changing uh, about all of that. The public's interest is in jobs and growth um, rather than in deficits and debt. Our debt uh, has a good chance of being stabilized uh, that is the deficit to debt ratio. Uh, the deficits have declined dramatically as the economy begins to increase. There are some Republican senators who are tired of playing opposition politics and want to get, want to get something, uh, uh, something done. So I think there are some green shoots, some opportunities for avoiding the worst of uh, self-destructive steps in, uh, in economic policy, but it does mean, it does mean that as we shift to foreign policy that the Obama administration has every interest in, in one 
fully exploiting the opportunities that exist in international economic policy. And that's why you see the very, the very aggressive efforts to, to move ahead uh, in the cross-Pacific agreements as well as in a US-Europe uh, uh, free trade uh, agreement. Um, we know defense cuts are coming. It's, it's inevitable, but there's some thinking going on about how to tailor those to uh, changes in strategy, which in my view will not lead to any diminution in the US presence in Asia, which is seen as of paramount importance. Uh, thirdly, it, as has been uh, mentioned uh, already, uh, uh, John Kerry, who had relatively little experience in Asia relative to the rest of the globe, uh, uh, is actually off to, uh, off to a good start. And uh, the environment within Asia itself is encouraging. The final point here is Republicans have as much, many differences within their party as they do with the Democrats on matters having to do with aspects of foreign policy, especially in dealing with, uh, with Asia and China and Taiwan. And, and, and therefore, my view is the administration really has the room to conduct uh, a sensible, intelligent, aggressive, activist uh, uh, foreign policy in and, and Asia. And that's why I end on the same note as, uh, as, my, uh, as my colleagues. Uh, complications and Taiwan attitudes of, of what they want. And in the, in the changes in China, we've got a mess in our domestic politics. But in spite of that, uh, uh, we can sort of carry on and in the, in the incentives uh, and the resources, though constrained, are there to, uh, to get the job done. I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, 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 to participate, to be here, and beg your forgiveness for having to run off uh, right now to have any chance of, uh, of making my plane. Uh, uh, let's hope an air traffic controller uh, or two was not furloughed today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Good luck. <laughs> okay, now we're going to take some questions uh, for the panel. Um, as usual with our standard practice here, uh, we're going to have you identify yourself, and please do limit your comments to a question. Uh, I will enforce that very vigorously. Uh, we're going to start off with Bonnie here up front. Thank you. Uh, Bonnie Glazer uh, here at CSIS. Emerson, I have uh, two questions for you. There is no free lunch, so I'm going to try to draw out some of the policy implications. I'm wondering if you could address the issue of what you think would change the attitudes of the people of Taiwan toward reunification and make them more supportive. And the second question is, uh, you of course, didn't talk much about President Ma, but as we all know, his poll ratings have been quite low. And I'm wondering if you would speculate on why you think his poll ratings remain as low as they are. Thanks. Uh, I. Can, can, can we accumulate more questions? Uh, I need to think. I, I need to think. <laughs> Here, please. Hi, Eric Lowe with uh, the Fair Observer. My question is that um, uh, since you talk about you know the realization of the Taiwanese, they expect unification to take place, even though they might not want that to happen. Uh, in, a, in a very, uh, uh, what do you call it, a very realistic way. So what are the expectations, what, what, what the scenario they are thinking about would happen? Or do they have like expectation, would China be reformed to a, to a certain extent that they would accept more favorable to a unification? Thank you. 
Want to want to take one more? Or <laughs> Are you ready to go? <laughs> let's let's take one more right here, and then uh, then we're going to put you on the spot. Yeah, Chen uh, Sheng Zhao, American University, again with Emerson. A very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, just along uh, Bonnie's question, but push a little bit harder. That is, you, you basically present what, but you didn't answer why. And uh, with the past decades, you know, if from today's uh, conference, we can see there are three factors. Taiwan factor, China factor, United States factor. So wh how do you analysis those, you know, uh, whether any of those making the situation develop uh, along the line you just presented. And also, how do you put, even though you prefer not talk about Ma ying but how do you put uh, President Ma ying into those different uh, categories? Uh, what What is your analysis of his attitude toward independence or toward unification? Thank you. I have to... Uh <laughs> Time to step up to the plate. <laughs> you know, um, on the unification, it, again, if I use the survey data, actually, younger generation think unification is more likely to happen than older generation. More educated people actually think unification is more likely to be the outcome. Right? These two variables, you know, these two variables stand out. It doesn't matter how I try to manipulate the data. Yeah, and so the younger generation, I think they, they, they see the reality. You know, it, it's inescapable. inescapable. You know, China is such a powerful magnet, right? It doesn't matter whether they like it or not, they have to find a job in China, all right? It doesn't matter whether they like the, the, the Beijing fog, they have to live in Beijing, all right? That's the conundrum that a small potato, a small power that often has to live with. You know, so unification doesn't matter whether they want it or not. It's, they think China is such a powerful player, and it's in not not they don't have a choice. I think it's more it's not something they. But what what can um, China do or Taiwan do in order to win Taiwanese heart? I think try softball. You know, try soft approaches. You know, don't use. Like, I don't know, like when, when Chen Ju, the Kaohsiung city mayor, tried to invite Dalai Lama to Kaohsiung city, right? And uh, Taiwan, uh, the Chinese government could order Chinese tourists not to visit Kaohsiung city. That drove the hotel owners, restaurant owners just crazy. You know, they want business. That's, China knows how to e use economic power to punish, sanction Taiwan, even at, at such a micro level. All right, and, and Taiwanese, yeah, they feel the coercion already. They, they know, they, they feel the coercion. They, they don't think they can escape from that. Um, so I, don't, I cannot give you a more insightful policy, you know, like it takes time. But it, I think the trend is reversible, right? It just, it, if I continue, I'm going to really, <laughs> Like China, what has China been doing? You know, political reforms. What are the political reforms? They only talk about anti-corruption, right? Corrupt, corruption comes from some, somewhere. You cannot just fight the corruption. You have to change your system, but they don't want to deal with it. They, they say, oh, democracy takes time. All right, show us the timetable. Show us the blueprint. They don't even talk about the, they don't even want a discussion of the timetable, the blueprint, all right? You have to give Taiwanese voters some hope, all right? You cannot just show you, you have dollars, you have money, come and make money, all right? Dignity, you have to show them, hey, you are, you, 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 you are ready to make some political reforms, all right? I just don't see that at all, you know, that's the, I think that that's the you know the, the 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 part that I think Taiwanese are really turned off. Great, thanks. In the back there. Thank you. 
Jeffrey Lynn from Senator Angus King's office. I was wondering, given that you noted that, oh, sorry, despite Chinese military modernization over the past 10 years, that the number, percentage of Taiwanese who actually believe that China will attack has dropped somehow, and also on a more related, on a related note, is rising Taiwanese belief in the U.S., or at least consistent Taiwanese belief in the U.S. security guarantees sort of count for decreasing Taiwanese defense expenditures and the abolition of conscription? Thank you. I don't have a lot of answers. I, I'm just showing you some empirical facts. It, there, there is, uh, I think the U.S. security commitment to Taiwan is uh, you know, extremely critical. Right, so so you can see the, the there's a slight increase in um, Taiwanese perception of the uh, credibility of the security commitment uh, of the U.S. and and that corresponds to the 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 slight decrease of their perception of the China threat. So these two are you know these two variables are correlated, all right. But um, so the U.S. security commitment does matter. To, yeah. I, I, I don't have anything else to, to, to share with you on that. Uh, Michael. Uh, Mike Fonte, I'm the Washington liaison for the DPP. Uh, thanks for the presentations. Uh, I was, have a policy implication for you, uh, Dr. Liu. You said in your presentation that Taiwanese, the majority, vast majority feel they're already independent, no, no, under the name Republic of China, and no need to declare independence. That, as you know, is the DPP's position, right? Uh, we're already an independent, sovereign nation. And I think, I guess my policy implication for you is when you look at the data, it's clear where the Taiwanese people stand. And I think that that data shows that there's no problem in the stability across the strait from the Taiwan side. People want reconciliation, conciliation. They know where they stand. The problem is on the Chinese side. So my policy implication for that is the next time around, in the presidential election in Taiwan, I hope the United States will stay neutral. Because the last time, having walked Dr. Tsai Ing-wen around for visits and listened to various uh, reports from the Financial Times, it's clear the United States said the problem for stability was Tsai Ing-wen, the DPP. And I think your data shows that's not true. So the next time around, I hope the United States will stay neutral. Thanks. Is there a question in there? Uh, uh, up front here. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm Liu Zongyi from Shanghai Institute for International Study. Now I'm a visiting scholar in CSIS. Uh, I have a comment to Sun Yin's speech and uh, I have a question to Professor Niu. Uh, as for Sun Yin's speech, I, I think you just give us some uh, examples, some, some shortages about uh, uh, Chinese uh, uh, new leaders, uh, domestic politics, and uh, foreign, pol uh, foreign policy. But uh, you have no conclusion. Uh, I, I would like to know uh, what implications uh, from your speech to the relations, uh, to the relations of bilateral, across uh, strait relations and uh, uh, the trilateral relations between uh, uh, China, um, China mainland, Taiwan, and the United States. Uh, as for uh, Professor News, uh, 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 News President, uh, I, I think uh, I learned a lot from your presentation, uh, but I have a short comment about uh, Chinese uh, political re reform. Uh, actually, uh, in China now, there, there are many debates. Uh, some uh, some uh, scholars put forward uh, that we must uh, we must uh, increase political reform, and some uh, conservatives uh, think that we must uh, uh, keep uh, uh, incremental space, uh, uh, in, in, incremental pace. Uh, but I think uh, we can reach consensus on this on this issue because reform is a uh, a big uh, uh, tradition, a big uh, uh, tra uh, transition. Uh, I have a question to you. Uh, how about how how do you think about uh, uh, United States factor uh, from uh, public opinion of Taiwan? 
uh, in the close, more and more close relations, uh, 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 more and more cl uh, close re relations between uh, China mainland and Taiwan. Thank you. Yun, why don't you kick off? Thank you. Thank you for the great question. On the uh, cross strait relations and the US, China, Taiwan, trilateral relations, my argument is that it's a it's an interaction process. So the reason that I didn't draw any conclusion is because a lot of factors are still in flux. And although we could see some signs of China's foreign policy or China's Cray Street policy coming into shape, but still it's subject to a lot of a lot of changes and a lot of factors. For example, one um, one issue that the Chinese media had pointed out last week when John Kerry was visiting Beijing is that the health or the status, the the status of U.S.-China relations very much depends on what U.S. intends to do and what the U.S. policy is. Of course, the claim unfairly puts the responsibility of the bilateral relations on the shoulder of Washington, but it does reflect some of the reality. What China is going to do depends on what Taiwan is going to do and what Washington is going to do. For example, one key concern that I have learned in Beijing about Taiwan is, yes, so far in the past five years, the cross-strait cross relations have been relatively peaceful and stable, but what if, how about the next election? And what if in the next election the DPP comes to power again, and there might be future problems for, for China again. So I would say that Beijing's policy depends on the variation and the evolution of these factors. Thanks. I think the U.S. Um, plays a tremendously important role. Um, not just the security commitment, although it's ambiguous, uh, but at least my, you know, it exists, right? But I think the U.S. security commitment to Taiwan, right? The U.S. assurance to Taiwan is so critical because on the one hand, we want Taiwan to approach China, right? To reach out to China. But Taiwan is afraid. Taiwan has fear, all right? It's this fear inside us, right? On the one hand, we want to reach out, but we want to hold on something really firm when we reach out. And that thing is the United States. All right, if the U.S. is unwilling to give that kind of assurance to Taiwanese, Taiwanese will be very reluctant to reach out to China. All right, that's the role the U.S. can play. You know, it's not like stronger security commitment is no longer needed. It's even more important now because we want to push Taiwan, hey, go ahead, you know, you want to be, you know, try to uh, deal with China. But Taiwanese are afraid, all right? So you need to give them some assurance. So I think the U.S. plays a very, very important role there. You know, can really help China facilitate unification. You know, and don't try to say, hey, U.S. is interfering in the domestic politics. No, Taiwan needs that insurance from, from the U.S. Thank you, Dong Hui Yu with China Review News Agency. My question is for Professor Niu. Uh, in the survey you showed us, we found that Taiwanese people who favor independence increased sharply after 2009, while the people favor unification decreased significantly also after 2009. How would you interpret this phenomenon? Do you think this is an evidence that Ma administration's policy of cross-trade relations is actually helpful for a kind of hidden independence, just as many Chinese people mentioned. Thank you. I don't think um, Ma Injo has any hidden agenda uh, um, on, on that issue. He might have hidden agenda on <laughs> this. <laughs> On the independence thing, I don't think he has a hidden agenda on the independence. It's, it's, it's a curious empirical finding, right? Do, do I have an explanation? I don't have a good explanation for, you know, for, for this. Uh, why in the last two years this, this surge you know, for at least those who do not choose not to support unification, even conditionally? You know, the, the increase in uh, in independence is a you know, like few percentage increase. 
but the, the, in, the increase in not supporting unification, even conditionally, over 50%, that's, that's alarming. Yeah, for China, that's alarming. You, we, you are losing Taiwan. Yeah, that, that's, uh, you know, I hope, you know, China do something, otherwise, forget about it. Back there. Hi, uh, my name is Garrett Van Der Wees, editor of Taiwan Communique. Uh, I have a question for you and Sun. You really did an excellent presentation, really enjoyed that, and to see how Xi Jinping is actually changing way uh, of doing things uh, in China. Uh, you did not touch on the issue of Tibet and East Turkestan. Uh, do you have any indications how the, uh, Xi Jinping might change policies there? And a corollary to that isn't the way China deals with uh, Tibet and East Turkestan, in a sense, a distant mirror of how China could deal with Taiwan if it really had its way in the future. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, difficult question. Uh, first of all, I would say the Tibet and Xinjiang issue have become, a, they have been categorized in the, uh, in the category of national security issues for China. and to a great extent, not only the internal instability that these two issues have created inside China, but also um, I'm sure that you are aware that Beijing has always emphasized the interference of the foreign forces in these, uh, in these two issues. So in my studies of uh, China's national security decision making, um, those two issues are put, are put in the category of national security and with a strong linkage to, uh, to, to, to foreign powers. Um, as for what Xi Jinping might do differently in Tibet and in Xinjiang, so far we have not seen great indication of a major policy change. Because, um, well, for one, we know that the conversation, well, or the dialogue between Dalai Lama and the central government has not been resumed. Mm -hmm. And as for the, the Xinjiang issue, there's no dialogue between, uh, between Ch Chinese authority and the Uyghur groups in exile at all. And so far, what we see in China is, on one hand, the government is putting a great emphasis on the maintenance of the stability through either security apparatus or through, um, through security build-up. And on the other hand, Beijing also emphasized, I'm sure as you, you're very well aware, emphasized the economic development in the ethnic minority regions. Because Beijing still sees as economic development as a key, resolu key solution to the conflicts between the minor ethnic minorities and the, uh, the Han population and the central government. And once there seems to be a belief that once these minor ethnic minorities become richer, they have a better life, they will be, they will be happier with, uh, with the government uh, in Beijing. And whether that's going to turn out to be true, we don't know, but um, we will observe with great interest. Thank you. Let me just add on that last point. Uh, I, I think you know this is the the problem of expectation in some ways that Xi Jinping faces as the new leader, as as uh, Yun pointed out in several aspects of her presentation. There was a similar expectation because of his father's relationship with the Dalai Lama and so on that there might be you know some sort of a breakthrough there. But I think the issue is with all these things that we've just been talking about that he's facing, is he going to be able or willing to spend political capital to try to advance that, uh, you know, those issues? Probably not in the near term is my uh, uh, opinion. Up here, okay, the lady there, yep. Uh, hi, my name is Jen Bates, uh, private citizen. Um, I have a question for uh, Yun Sun. Uh, I'd like to know what you think the Xi administration's attitude is to direct election of the chief executive in Hong Kong, uh, whether it will happen and if so, when. And for Professor New, would uh, more evidence of democracy in Hong Kong help allay the fears of the Taiwanese people? I have not done much research into the situation in Hong Kong, so I'm sorry, I don't have an answer to your question. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, more democracy in Hong Kong? Yeah, that is to say, if there was direct election of the chief executive, which the Hong Kong people have been asking for for a long time, would that would that make the Taiwanese people feel a li little more comfortable oh, that eventually oh, oh, democracy that, would that. come to China? My personal opinion, I mean, just personal, I don't think so. It's 
it's, I, I can elaborate on that a little bit. I think the Chinese government, you know, the, the official line is, oh, you know, this multi-party competition, compare, you know, this, it's, it's a Western idea. It's a blind alley, you know, uh, that China doesn't want to venture into. But I want to remind you that the Chinese communists were very good at winning elections, all right? In the 40s, in those uh, guerrilla area, you know, after they form a united front with the nationalist government, they couldn't kill the landlords anymore, right? They have to win support from the peasants. So they introduced secret ballots, all right? So KM the KMT was defeated by the communists first by ballots in those areas. So the communist party won people's hearts before they used, before the civil wars, you know, that, in, it's, in those, what we call the guerrilla, it's Bianchi, right, guerrilla area, they didn't talk about communism, ideology, they talk about anti-Japanese, they talk about democracy, right? And, but they, they knew how to conduct elections, fair, you know, free and fair and democratic elections. But once they gained power, you know, I just, they just changed that just a few years ago in 2007. They, in their National Assembly, in the National People's Congress, only those who chose to abstain or, or vote against had to vote. Those who agree with, you know, in favor, they don't have to vote. So, so it's like that's power. Sometimes I wanted to become a Commerce Party member. It's like you have so much power, you really could manipulate things. You know, that, that kind of feeling is like, it's difficult for them to give away that power. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm complaining too much, so sorry. Right over here. Uh, Mike Masetic, PBS Online News Hour. In the islands dispute, we've seen both Taiwan and China play the Japan card, although in slightly different ways. Every time that there's a burst of Japanese nationalism, or an apparent one, like the Sunday visits to the shrine, doesn't this tend to push China and Taiwan closer together on things like the island dispute, which is a small nightmare for U.S. policymakers? Well, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Just, uh, I, I don't have a direct answer to your question, but uh, on, on the survey, I did ask, I did include some questions on that. So uh, the Taiwanese uh, respondents, they, they, they wanted their government, Taiwanese government, to take a tough position you know, toward Japan. But they also wanted the Chinese government to take a very tough position against, toward Japan on the, uh, the, the, the island dispute issue. So at least uh, you know, on this issue, the two, two sides had a uni former united front again. So, so that's the survey data shows. I would, uh, I would agree with you that the, uh, Japan's position on the disputed islands does tend to push Beijing and Taipei together t on, the same, on the same front. Although I would argue that a few weeks ago when Taiwan reached the Fisher Agreement with the Japanese government, that was perceived as uh, quite uh, a deviation from that, um, from that position in Beijing. I, I would just add that I think the Ma administration has been pretty clear that they don't want to be seen as aligned necessarily with the, with the PRC government on the subject. But. Uh, Brantley Womack, University of Virginia. Uh, Emerson, thank you for those wonderful statistics. I'm sure we'll have nightmares about them for uh, a while. And, and uh, what occurred to me in trying to make sense of the differences between expectations and preferences on unification is that perhaps unification in that question uh, carries a fair amount of, of baggage as unification, meaning uh, melting in to the rest of China, whereas maybe on the expectation question, it's seen as convergence versus divergence. Uh, and of course, this is the type of question that statisticians don't like because it, it uh, questions the categories <laughs> and therefore the compatibility of data. But it seems to me that just uh, 
in my one person opinion that that might explain some of the differences between those two answers. Well, in the interest of time and to keep things moving along and give you guys a, a short break, uh, please join me in thanking the panel, and we'll take a 15-minute break. Thank you.
Please take your seats. I'm Bonnie Glazer, and I'm a senior uh, advisor for Asia in the Freeman Chair for China Studies here at CSIS. And I will be moderating the second panel today, which is on cross-strait political and uh, security issues. Uh, of course, we have heard uh, that uh, Xi Jinping has emphasized really continuity in the cross-strait relationship. Uh, but many observers uh, nevertheless are predicting uh, that China might get uh, impatient uh, toward uh, Taiwan. Uh, and we've recently heard, I think, comments by uh, President Ma Yingzhou suggesting, um, I would say, in in increasingly explicit language, uh, stating, I would say, quite clearly that uh, politi that political dialogue is off the table uh, and that military confidence building measures were, will also not be discussed during his second term. And so I think that raises a lot of questions uh, for the future of cross-strait political security issues and very pleased that we have uh, three excellent speakers uh, to, on, our, on our panel to discuss these uh, issues. Uh, uh, I will just introduce them all uh, together and then invite them up uh, separately uh, to give their remarks. We'll be hearing first from uh, Professor Zhao Quansheng, who is a professor of international relations and director of the Center for Asian Studies at American University. And uh, many of you may know that he also served as director of the Division of Comparative and uh, Regional Studies uh, there at, uh, at AU. And then we will have uh, uh, Dr. Wang Gao Cheng, who is professor of the Graduate Institute of International Affairs and Strategic Studies at uh, Damkang University. And uh, he is uh, a PhD from uh, University of Pennsylvania and uh, served as National Assemblyman uh, in Taiwan from 96 uh, to, to 2000 and in 2006. And then uh, wrapping up, uh, we will have Dr. Richard Bush, who of course is a, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and director of its Center for Northeast Asia uh, Policy Studies. So I'll ask each of our speakers to please not exceed uh, 15 minutes, and uh, that will leave us plenty of time uh, for Q&A. So uh, we'll start with you, uh, Dr. Zhao. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I have prepared a, a five points, uh, talking points here. Uh, with Bunny just uh, said that we have 15 minutes, so uh, three minutes per point. Uh, I here uh, I would like to make my own analysis uh, of the cross-grade political and security uh, issues. Uh, from Beijing perspective, but of course, it's my own understanding uh, of uh, Beijing's uh, position and the policy. Uh, and of course, uh, later we will have more Q&A for uh, more discuss. Uh, uh, first, current status. Second, economic versus political integration. Third, major obstacles and the fourth, Beijing's policy and the response, and finally, future directions. Uh, so those are uh, my five uh, prepared uh, points. Uh, the, the first one, uh, current status. Uh, over the past decades, particularly after uh, Ma Yingju's, uh, I mean, uh, over the, not really past decade, but since Ma Yingju's uh, regime, uh, the major status of cross-strait relations uh, is that relationship stabilized. Uh, so uh, we don't really hear uh, some wording or some term such as troublemaker and others. Uh, and, but nevertheless, uh, there are still, even though 
overwhelmingly positive toward my Yingju administration, uh, but there are still ambivalent feeling that is economic pretty uh, smooth, the integration, but political uh, lag behind, and uh, so uh, so wondering what's uh, is the first panel one question uh, asked whether there are hidden agendas or not. So there are some kind of suspicion as well. Uh, the current status also include the new uh, policy teams, as we can see over the past year, uh, there are uh, Ma Yingjiu's second term, uh, and also in Beijing, uh, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, uh, so Xi Li administration, and each side also constructed security, foreign policy, and Taiwan policy teams. Uh, we all understand, for example, Zhang Zhijun replaced Wang Yi, and, and also the same thing happened uh, in Taipei. So we do see each side has new teams uh, working like uh, uh, Yang Jiechi replaced Dai Bingguo, uh, among others. You know, all those kind of new personnel. But nevertheless, of course, uh, the cross-strait relations still of, uh, closely monitored and controlled by the top leaders. Uh, from Beijing side is uh, Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang, and from Taipei side uh, is Ma Yingjiu. The second topic is economic versus political in integration. Uh, Needless to say, uh, there are much progress in economic integration represented by uh, uh, ECFA. Uh, so uh, it's ma much faster in terms of uh, bilateral uh, cross-street relations in economic dimension. Uh, the other dimensions such as uh, cultural and education uh, we also have seen a very much uh, progress. I'm not going to give you details, uh, but the whether there is a linkage between economic integration and political uh, integration is a huge question mark. As we can see from this morning's Amazon's presentation, it's not necessarily so, at least from public opinion survey in Taipei. Uh, so that's also presented a puzzle. Uh, that is why this is the case. So this is the second uh, issue I would like to do. And the thirdly is what are the major obstacles uh, from Beijing's perspective in terms of political and the security dimensions? Uh, the, there are four obstacles. Uh, first, still domestically, I mean inside Taiwan, uh, we do see a great pressure uh, from so-called green camp. Uh, so uh, Ma Yingju has to uh, be very much considering uh, this opposition Camp and also, of course, uh, public opinion and others so could not move uh, too fast. Uh, the second issue, uh, obstacle, is still an identity issue. Uh, that issue not totally solved. Uh, we all understand that Chen shui -bian has a, a de signalization campaign. And uh, even though Ma Yingju made some corrections in that direction, but still the sentiment apart from uh, uh, mainland China is still there. And, the, and the thirdly, of course, uh, I guess Beijing also realized that uh, the uh, uh, Beijing's current development, pol particularly political reform, uh, is far from satisfaction. Uh, moving toward unification. So I guess that's also clear. And, and lastly is so-called external factors from uh, Beijing's perspective. One, of course, 
U.S. arms sale to Taiwan and provide uh, security uh, protection. And uh, the other is Japan. Uh, most recent fishery agreement uh, regarded uh, as a way to divide uh, Taiwan from mainland China. The, let me move to the fourth question that I prepared, that is Beijing's policy and the response. Uh, the, uh, in general, uh, my understanding is that uh, comparatively with the Chen Shui-bian regime, uh, Beijing uh, much less worried uh, about the future independence. However, is still concerned uh, about the uh, direction. Uh, therefore, uh, I would say that Beijing preferred to put the pressure continue, uh, not, you know, in terms of, for example, uh, the uh, so-called uh, the uh, uh, the the ceasefire of diplomas, diplomatic war. Uh, and uh, the pressure, uh, even though with that direction, but still in terms of international, so-called international space, uh, still very limited uh, and uh, less negotiable. Um, the communication across Taiwan Strait, from my understanding, is pretty much through internal and in internal first. There are a lot of dialogue, uh, for example, from in a Boao and others. Uh, but uh, uh, in a way, also sort of informal, because even Xiao Wanchang uh, and others is not really, and Lian Zhan, is not really necessarily uh, representing Ma Yingjiu fully. Of, uh, so there are uh, many internal and informal channels and continue for uh, negotiation. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we uh, do see uh, there are potential for institutionalize of the, the channels. For example, now uh, talking about mutually setting up representative office in Beijing and Taipei. And another uh, possibility, so uh, now let me move to, uh, oh, another policy and response is looking for more opportunities uh, to have uh, cooperation in security and the political dimensions, such as the dispute in South China Sea and the Diaoyu Sankaku Island. So there are certainly uh, pressure uh, to uh, from Beijing to uh, uh, making Taiwan have a positive uh, reaction uh, along these lines, so that there might be uh, a, a either uh, uh, most likely a informal style of a cooperation in this security uh, dimension. But naturally, there are also uh, m much discussions among retired generals and the retired diplomats uh, from both sides. And finally, let me just touch upon the future directions. Uh, I would say that uh, uh, from Beijing perspective, very much, of course, uh, uh, looking forward to a possible breakthrough uh, during the second Ma regime, and particularly with Xi uh, as a new leader. Uh, there is a huge question mark uh, that, that is whether possible uh, for the next three, four years, uh, there will be a Xima summit. Uh, so I guess that's the, uh, the uh, 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 much hoped uh, uh, breakthrough, but of course, like I said, it, it's a big question mark because Ma already pledged He's not going to move fast. Uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, directions is to expand 
uh, bilateral consultation in both international and security uh, affairs. I already mentioned some specific cases, such as the South China Sea uh, dispute, and uh, I understand, and also Diao Yu San Kaku, I understand there are uh, every year for the past couple of years, uh, there are, uh, uh, if we can use the term, uh, that is uh, the uh, 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 track two uh, or, or track one half, you know, the scholars and the semi-officials uh, meeting together to discuss those issues. Uh, and needless to say, Beijing is also ready uh, to uh, provide economic continued uh, benefits uh, to Taiwan, uh, so-called uh, uh, the uh, dividend of reform and uh, the, the gr economic growth. And the, uh, the hope and for future potential, if we can uh, watch, uh, that is uh, the, what I already mentioned, the institutionalization uh, of cross-street channels and institutions, uh, that is still under negotiation, uh, but is likely to happen. Uh, so overall, uh, my sense of that is, in general, uh, it's less worried, uh, but still concerned uh, that there will be continued pressure uh, from Beijing to move toward not only economic integration, but further a possible breakthrough in political dimension. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhao, and thank you for being succinct and clear. Uh, I welcome that, and uh, we'll expect the same from our next speaker. Uh, Professor Wang Gaocheng, you're next. Okay, thank you, uh, Bani. I, I feel very honored to be here uh, to present my uh, observe about the uh, future cross-trade relation. I first will thank uh, uh, Dr. Christoph Johnson and Dr. Richard Bush invitation to be here. Uh, I will provide um, uh, a so-called per Taiwan's perspective on this issue. Although I, I think I cannot represent the whole Taiwanese, I can just be an observer from, uh, from Taiwan uh, to uh, provide my observation on this issue. I also provide uh, a, a slide uh, a document uh, to express the, my idea so that you can understand what I say more clearly. Uh, my talk uh, will uh, divide into three sections. Uh, one is the possibility to have such a talk in the next few years. The second would, uh, if this talk, what are those the issues that Taiwan want to address on uh, in the talk? Uh, the third part is that uh, what's uh, the I would think the, the, the best strategy to promote that kind of political and security dialogue across the strait. First, about the likelihood of talks to, uh, on the political and the security issue in the next few years, the, uh, my personal feeling is that is the, at least from Taiwan's side, although uh, China is pushing on that issue, I think uh, uh, is very a uh, few uh, in the next few years, uh, especially uh, in the mass, the second term. Uh, I got that conclusion based on the following reason. Uh, first, uh, uh, I think that most Taiwanese uh, prefer to maintain the status quo, uh, which the uh, Professor Emerson Liu just uh, uh, provide uh, uh, empirical data. Uh, I also have a, a simple data. According to a poll conducted by uh, Taiwan's the Main Affairs Council the recently, uh, in the last months, uh, uh, show that 86% uh, uh, of Taiwanese, uh, in fact, uh, support maintaining uh, the cross status quo. Uh, that means the no unification with China and no independence of uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, so uh, many people uh, worry about that if there's a cross-trade uh, political negotiation uh, uh, being set, uh, that might represent the, the beginning of uh, uh, evolution into a so-called unification uh, negotiation. Uh, so they worry about uh, that kind of uh, talk. Uh, so given that uh, status, uh, so that's why uh, Barney just mentioned uh, in a recent uh, interview this month, uh, 
President Ma said that uh, he thought that uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, do not currently regard the cross-strait political dialogue as needed. Second, I think there would be a strong opposition from uh, Taiwan's opposition party, uh, DPP, uh, if there's a talk uh, uh, settled between the KMT government uh, and uh, Beijing. Uh, uh, I think that uh, DPP uh, ideologically uh, opposed uh, a future unification uh, between China and Taiwan. Uh, so they will consider any that kind of uh, a dialogue means that the KMT government want to push the, towards that end, uh, so that they will uh, strongly oppose that kind of talk. Uh, and the DPP currently uh, had uh, of uh, has uh, 40 seats uh, in the legislature, uh, which has the, uh, totally 113 uh, seats. That means that the DPP has accounted for the 35 point uh, uh, percent uh, in the legislature, uh, which uh, constitutes a strong opposition uh, force in, in Taiwan's the, uh, political stage. Uh. Third, uh, I think that the President Ma Yin-jeou's personal popularity uh, is quite low. Uh, uh, according to a survey done by an uh, independent uh, survey company uh, in, in March, uh, in fact, uh, uh, President Ma's trust rate uh, was only 26%. Uh, this trust rate was the, about uh, uh, 56%. And also, according to another source of a local Taiwan uh, uh, TV station down the, in January this year, a uh, mass approval rate was uh, only uh, of about 14 uh, percent. So given that kind of low popularity and approval rate, uh, I think it's very difficult for President Ma uh, to strongly push an uh, issue uh, which uh, is not liked by the opposition parties and the most Taiwanese. Uh, so that's why uh, President Ma uh, said in that uh, interview that uh, in, the, in the near future, uh, he will still the, uh, adhere to the principle of uh, economic first and the political latest uh, in promoting uh, the cross-trade relation. Uh, first, the, the, the political stance of the two sides still uh, diverges substantially. Uh, uh, the bottom line is that uh, Beijing uh, uh, considers Taiwan is part of, of it and does not recognize the existence of a, a Republic of uh, China, uh, that is Taiwan. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, Taipei insists that the, the ROC has still existed after 1949 uh, and includes the mainland and Taiwan. Uh, given such uh, diversified political position, I think it needs more effort uh, to get a, a talk uh, uh, reach a consensus. Uh, uh, fifth, uh, on the political uh, issue, uh, I'm sorry, uh, on the security issue, I think that uh, uh, many Taiwanese are, are skeptical uh, on the effectiveness of a, a cross-trade security uh, agreement. Uh, I think there's two reasons for that. Uh, first, uh, the gap of military capability uh, between the two sides is quite large. Uh, so I think the Taiwan lacks that uh, ki uh, kind of uh, confidence to, uh, to have a real uh, negotiation on a security arrangement between the, the two sides. Uh, the second, uh, um, China is so far still an authoritarian regime. Uh, many Taiwanese worry that if there's a, a security agreement reached between the two sides, whether China can uh, sincerely uh, to honor its uh, commitment to that kind of security agreement. Uh, so I think uh, uh, many Taiwanese so far still uh, adopt that uh, the, uh, the, effect, uh, the effectiveness of a security agreement between the two sides if uh, it, uh, it is reached. Uh, so I think based on the previous uh, uh, five reasons, uh, I think uh, uh, I get a conclusion that uh, uh, President Ma, I think uh, subjectively, uh, he, he himself is reluctant uh, to promote a uh, uh, political dialogue across trade. And uh, uh, objectively, I think he faced a strong uh, constraint uh, from Taiwan's society and the opposition party uh, to conduct, conduct that kind of talk. Uh, Secondly, I will uh, uh, discuss, but if there's a, a talk on the political and the security issue, what Taiwan expect uh, from that, uh, that kind of a uh, dialogue? I think that uh, on the political issues, uh, Taiwan uh, at least will desire two things. First, uh, we would like to have uh, equality of political status across the strait. Uh, 
through that uh, of a pre negotiation. Uh, uh, according to, in fact, according to the uh, the ROC Constitution, uh, we can accept uh, the so-called One China principles. Uh, that's no no question. Uh, but we think that uh, uh, ROC government still exists. Uh, uh, and it covers the, both the Taiwan and the mainland China. Uh, so I think uh, uh, given a one China principle, we will demand uh, an equal footing position uh, versus the uh, uh, mainland, uh, versus Beijing. Uh, so I, I think we would have, we would expect, uh, we had better that uh, uh, China uh, at least uh, can admit uh, the existence of uh, ROC government and starting from that position uh, to pursue uh, the future uh, political relations to, uh, across the strait. But that means that we are pursuing a two states policies. Uh, I think we can consider that uh, a one a spatial relationship under the one China principle. Uh, that is not a state to state relation, uh, but a spatial arrangement uh, between the two sides uh, under one China principles. Second, uh, I think Taiwan will uh, require that we will have more international uh, space uh, under the One China uh, principles. Um, given the development of the last few years, the, uh, right now uh, Taiwan uh, is an observer of the WHA. Uh, we think that's a good development, uh, but we expect that this model uh, can be applied to more uh, UN spatial agency uh, and other international organizations, uh, especially uh, currently Taiwan government uh, is strongly pursue uh, participation in the uh, UNFCCC and ICAO. Uh, and also uh, we will think that if there's a better arrangement uh, that we cannot, we not just get the observer status, uh, if we can uh, grant it uh, a formal membership in those organizations, uh, that would be more uh, preferred uh, by Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese government. Of course, that can be done uh, under the One China principles. Uh, regarding the security issues, the, about the, on the military side, uh, we can uh, accept uh, uh, to uh, create uh, the confidence building major across the strait. Uh, but however, uh, given the gap between the capability uh, of Taiwan and the mainland China, we will expect that uh, uh, China may can do some initiative to show its uh, uh, kindness to Taiwan uh, uh, and also give Taiwanese confidence to pursue that uh, goal. Uh, so we will uh, require that uh, maybe China can at least uh, you know, reduce the, its military uh, threat currently against tai, uh, Taiwan. Uh, for example, uh, Taiwanese government uh, has demanded that uh, uh, maybe China can remove its missiles currently against Taiwan uh, before that kind of talk uh, uh, be conducted. Uh, regarding the uh, CBM, uh, we can accept uh, the, the usual content of uh, 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 CBM. Uh, that is that we can uh, increase that include that uh, both sides increasing its military uh, transparency, uh, setting up a communication channel uh, to avoid uh, an extended uh, com uh, conflict, uh, and create uh, some restraint measures uh, on each side's the military capabilities and activities. Uh, and of course, uh, we will uh, pay it attention that there should be effective censorship mechanism uh, to assure uh, that uh, China would adhere to those CBMs reached. Uh, regarding the uh, peace agreement, uh, I think it's a political arrangement. Uh, uh, we think that if there's a, 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 a talk on that, at least there should be already a strong uh, economic and social base uh, reached uh, across the strait. That is, uh, we will like to have more engagement uh, in the in interaction between the two sides so that Taiwanese will be more familiar with the, uh, mainland China and also more accept uh, uh, mainland. Uh, and if there's a preliminary uh, CBM are reached, uh, that would be better. Uh, or at the very least, uh, I, we think that China uh, should also uh, take the initiative to reduce the, the military threat against Taiwan uh, be, 
before that uh, kind of talk can be uh, conducted. And after that uh, peace agreement reached, uh, we also hope that uh, there should be an uh, effective censorship mechanism uh, to ensure China's adherence to that agreement. Finally, uh, given those uh, difficulty and obstacles, uh, my idea, my opinion is that uh, uh, if we both sides want to promote that kind of relationship, uh, I think uh, there's uh, several uh, uh, steps uh, that can be considered by both sides. Uh, first, first uh, I think both sides can start from a track to a platform. Second, I think both sides should uh, promote that uh, uh, talk uh, based on the principle of uh, incrementalism, uh, consensus reached by two sides, and uh, uh, equality. Uh, third, I think the PRC should uh, uh, establish uh, communication with the DBP to reduce the domestic uh, obstacle from Taiwan. Uh, first, uh, I think the, the PRC should take actual steps uh, to reduce military deployment against, against Taiwan before those talks can be conducted. Uh, that's my, my point. Uh, thank you for your attention and welcome your comment. Thank you. Excellent. We'll turn now to our last speaker, Dr. Richard Bush. Thank you very much, Bonnie. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my job is to uh, provide the American perspective on all of this. Um, of course, uh, the United States is a very pluralistic, uh, even polarized country, and um, so it's impossible to sort of capture the full range of American views in any one session. My good friend Ray Berghardt will uh, give us, uh, I think, a very good um, reflection of the administration's point of view. Um, so what you're going to hear from me is just the views of one humble scholar. Um, I would like to talk about these issues at, at really two levels. One is more a strategic or macro level, and then one is a spe a more specifically military level. Um, I think in, in broad uh, strategic terms, what has happened in the last five years has been a real boon to the United States. Um, if we think back to the situation before 2008, uh, it was one of increasing uh, mutual fear among all three parties in this triangle. I mean, the, the uh, strongest fear was between China and Taiwan, where each side feared that the other was going to do something that would um, challenge its fundamental interests, and then it had to take steps to hedge against that, and you had kind of a vicious circle. The, the U.S. fear was that through some kind of miscalculation or excessive action, the, the two sides would slip into a conflict uh, that neither wanted, and then um, we would be involved. So this was um, uh, not an easy time. Uh, there were white knuckles all around. Uh, and um, what happened after, uh, really starting in 2005, with some initiatives by President Hu Jintao were, were some some steps taken by uh, the CCP leadership and then by President Ma ying that um, involved a certain amount of, uh, of risk, uh, at least domestic political risk, but uh, sought to reassure um, each, uh, reassure the other and expand on areas of cooperation. And uh, so far, this has worked well. Uh, and as I say, it's good for the United States. This is one less problem we have to worry about on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Uh, and um, we have plenty of problems around the world, and we even have some new problems in Asia. So um, this has been good. And um, based on the implicit linkage that exists between what Taiwan does in cross-strait relations and U.S.-Taiwan relations, um, our ties with uh, Taiwan have improved uh, over the last uh, four years. Now, um, some Americans looking at this situation um, draw some rather stark conclusions, and they form kind of the bookends for the American discussion of this issue. One view is that uh, essentially Taiwan is abandoning the United States. 
that it is moving towards a strategic choice, uh, essentially to bandwagon with China and to uh, no longer um, feel that it needs uh, the U.S. security commitment and a strong relationship with the United States. I mean, this is the idea of Finlandization. On the other hand, you have uh, people who suggest that um, Taiwan, or specifically our security relationship with Taiwan, uh, is becoming, uh, in effect, a strategic liability for the United States, and that our commitments to Taiwan um, get in the way of uh, a productive relationship with China, and that is the strategic imperative for the United States. So we should um, find some way to uh, reduce commitments to Taiwan and, and yield the benefits uh, that accrue. I agree with neither of these views. Um, I think the mainstream view is that uh, there are still very good reasons uh, for the United States to re remain committed to Taiwan and to help Taiwan in appropriate ways. Um, and um, uh, I think that's the dominant view so far. Now, um, that's what's happened to date. What's likely to happen in the future? Now, we all know what China would probably like to happen. Uh, it's that there be movement uh, to discussion of political and security issues, uh, and that there therefore be progress on the road to um, achieving China's uh, ultimate goal, and that's unification. I'm not saying unification right away, but, but movement in that direction. Um, similarly, we all know what President Ma intends, and that is not too much. Uh, he set a pretty low set of expectations for his second term. Um, uh, things that are doable and yield some benefit. Um, but um, he has said pretty explicitly that um, political talks uh, or talks on political issues are premature. Uh, he's not quite clear how a formal peace accord would uh, contribute to Taiwan's security. Um, I think that President Ma has a good sense of the political constraints that are um, binding him to um, sort of limited and cautious action. One is the political environment in Taiwan itself, and Emerson's um, data, uh, I think, have only um, sort of justified that view. Then uh, there's um, uh, what I think is a conceptual gap uh, between um, Beijing and Taipei, it's essentially over the uh, status of the Republic of China, uh, and which uh, previous speakers have discussed. Um, so I think that what we're likely to see um, for the remainder of President Ma's term is a, a slowdown in the momentum um, uh, of cross-strait relations, maybe uh, even some kind of stall. Uh, I think there will continue to be progress in the economic area and maybe the cultural area, but uh, these will probably be more difficult uh, because they affect uh, more domestic interest. Um, I, I think it remains important that the two sides do a good job of implementing well what they've already agreed to, to build confidence for the future. Um, I think that this situation is fine for the United States. Um, we have always taken the view, I think, that as long as U.S. national security interests are not affected, um, we're happy for the two sides of the strait to set the pace and scope of cross-strait interaction. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think that um, a slowdown in momentum uh, does not really affect our national security interests. Um, there is the lurking question, which Bonnie uh, alluded to, and that is, what if China loses patience? Um, I don't think China will lose patience in the near term, uh, by which I mean the rest of President Mao's presidency, three more years. Um, as we've heard, the starting point of the Xi Jinping administration is uh, 
uh, continuity and I think a realism about what is possible given the uh, current Taiwan political environment. Still, we hear complaints and grousing from uh, scholars, at least, about uh, Ma's intentions and uh, a, a lack of seriousness. Um, the situation uh, becomes more interesting, uh, if I could use that word, uh, if the DPP were to return to power uh, in 2016 or 2020. Um, I hope that, that Beijing doesn't uh, overreact in that situation. Uh, it, you know, it has learned how to cope with the DPP administration. It has a decent playbook. And the United States is part of that playbook. Um, and I think you know, the United States, uh, from long experience of dealing with political transitions in democratic countries, uh, would um, find ways uh, to adjust as well. Uh, the most um, pressing question, I think, is uh, whether um, Beijing loses patience and then resorts, as a result, to um, uh, an approach of pressure and intimidation. And Emerson's data is interesting um, on this, that um, Taiwan people uh, don't want unification, at least in the current setting, but they expect it's going to happen. Well, um, you know, one of the ways it would happen is that if uh, um, Beijing uh, stepped up the pressure uh, on Taiwan. Um, I think that this would pose um, uh, a big challenge for the United States because uh, a Taiwan that submitted uh, to pressure um, would do so um, without any violence having occurred, probably, but still it would not be a, a voluntary choice. Um, so uh, that would be complicated for us. Um, obviously, the ultimate form of pressure and intimidation is um, military coercion. And so here I'm sort of shifting from the macro to more of the micro. Um, we have seen uh, a PRC military buildup that has continued, um, and that has changed the threat environment in which uh, Taiwan exists. Um, now, one would expect in this situation for Taiwan to acquire uh, capabilities that are, number one, appropriate to this changing threat environment, um, and, and number two, also enhance deterrence against hostile action. Um, capabilities that would raise the risks of um, PRC coercion and um, complicate any uh, temptation to move in that direction. The, the big question is how to do that. Um, I think we're aware that uh, for a long time there's been a bit of a disconnect between Taiwan and the United States about what um, capabilities uh, Taiwan really needs, and uh, there's an impression, at least from the outside, that um, Taiwan prefers capabilities that make more of a political statement, and uh, the United States uh, prefers capabilities that have a military utility. I mean, this isn't a black and white thing. We understand the value of, of the political value of arms sales, and uh, Taiwan sort of understands military utility, but it's a, it's a question of emphasis. Um, in this regard, I would like to um, cite a very interesting statement uh, that a Pentagon official, Peter Lavoy, made uh, on this issue um, in October 2011. And um, Dr. Lavoy said, um, lasting security uh, for Taiwan cannot be achieved simply by purchasing limited numbers of advanced weapons systems Taiwan must also, and the word also is important, devote attention to asymmetric concepts and technologies that maximize Taiwan's enduring strengths and advantages. Uh, I think there's some very interesting implications uh, in this statement, but uh, I think I've run out of time, and, and I um, will close only by uh, making an advertisement 
Uh, and that is for a, a, another program that Brookings and CSIS are doing together um, next Monday on um, the recent uh, or the quadrennial, quadrennial defense review that Taiwan has just released. And uh, I think it, um, our discussion will speak to these issues. Um, it, um, the program will take place at 2 o'clock at Brookings. This is kind of a home and home series. Um, and uh, we welcome all of you to attend, and please tell your friends. Thank you very much. And for that event, we will have uh, the Vice uh, Defense Minister uh, from Taiwan, uh, Yang Nianzu, Andrew Yang, will be uh, in town for that. So we welcome all of you uh, to join. Uh, so three very, um, very rich presentations and raises, I think, a lot of issues to discuss. I am going to restrain myself, um, but I might jump in later. Uh, so let's open it up to the floor now for questions and comments. Please wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and be brief so that we can work in uh, as many questions uh, as possible. Right over there. Ken Meyer, Gord World Docs. Uh, what do the Taiwanese uh, perceive is the United States' motivation uh, with regard to its involvement with Taiwan? All right, we're going to collect a couple of questions and then we'll come back to the panel. Over here. Hi, uh, Chen Weihua, China Daily. It seems to me that the problem laid out here, I mean, by Dr. Wang as a sort of a temporary, you know, obstacle that can be overcome, like uh, communicating with DPP or, you know, uh, like a missile deployment, you know, that can be done tomorrow if, you know, I think a DPP doesn't uh, go the way, I mean, future uh, government doesn't go the way Chen Sui Bian did a decade ago. My question is really, I mean, how accurately can we today predict uh, things like uh, decades from now? Obviously, 40 years ago, no one can predict that uh, people in Taiwan and the uh, mainland can travel freely. I mean, I think Lin Yifu obviously didn't predict that uh, when he swam across the strait. And uh, also, I think uh, no one imagined that uh, Lian Zhang would have made a trip to mainland like uh, in 2004. So all this happened in a matter of just 20, 30 years. So we probably can't predict things uh, three, four years from now. But I mean, we are talking, I mean, no one Is thinking, yeah, no one thinking about the unification will be achieved in three, four years. But we are talking about something 30 years from now. So how accurate is you, you think all these prediction would should be? Okay, and then we'll take one more and we'll come back to the panel over there. Jeffrey Lin from Senator Angus King's office. I was wondering, uh, while going, I hope this isn't going too deep into the bushes, so to speak, but, pardon, an intentional pun, but what level of cooperation between uh, the US and Taiwan would be that it wouldn't necessarily irritate China because to a great degree. For example, we've seen in recent arms deals, such as the sale of Apache hel attack helicopters to Taiwan, that China hasn't raised big a fuss as it did, say, back in 2001 when we sold them kid class guided missile destroyers. Thank you. Oh, sorry, my microphone wasn't on. <laughs> Who would like to start? Okay, uh, okay Professor uh, Wang. Well, Chinese are in the bur stupid bird and fly first. So like, uh, <laughs> about the, I, I think the America, uh, Taiwan's understanding about American attitude to this, that uh, uh, there's the sound in Taiwan that uh, you are United States worried that we are too close to, to, to mainland China, uh, especially on the uh, political and the security issues. Uh, so they are worried that that might uh, interfere the United States willingness to, to sell advanced weapon uh, to to Taiwan. Uh, I, I would say that not the represent the the, the whole uh, uh, Taiwanese uh, uh, voice, but uh, just do the concern uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, that, that that that's one thing. 
uh, about the future uh, cross-strait uh, relation, because uh, I'm not predicting the, the 30 or 40 years the latest. I'm talking about, uh, you know, based on the, the data, I get uh, the uh, President Ma's the second uh, term. Uh, but like, like I said, that um, uh, we, uh, in fact, welcome the continued cross-strait uh, economic and cultural uh, engagement. Uh, hope that uh, with the deepening of that kind of uh, relationship, the both sides uh, you know, can continue to improve the political relation and find a way uh, to solve that uh, uh, difficulty. Um, from my understanding, I cannot represent uh, China's uh, attitude, but I will think that uh, uh, given the, the recent improvement of cross-trade relations, the, uh, uh, probably I think China will concern very much about the U.S. sale, the you know submarines, the, or more advanced the, the jet flight uh, uh, to to Taiwan. Uh, but uh, uh, still, I mean that given the the, the improvement of cross-trade uh, relations, the, uh, we don't still don't know the, how that kind of development will constrain China's the reactions. To, to those the selling of weapon. Uh, thank you. Uh, one question about the future uh, directions, uh, and, and also the question about maybe next 10 years. Or, uh, we all remember that when uh, Nixon and Kissinger visited Beijing, meeting with uh, Mao Zedong, and Mao said to him, you know, we, have, we can wait for 100 years. Uh, so now only 40, some 41 years passed. So there are still, uh, in that case, that's, that's a long time to, and also if, if I recall my own experience, uh, that exactly 30 years ago in San Francisco, uh, Asian Studies Association, uh, the first open dialogue uh, cross street, relations among scholars, that is Professor Hong Da Chiu, Chiu Hong Da of University of Maryland, and I myself in San Francisco, we had that discuss. Uh, later, the two articles published in Asian Survey in 1983. So if we look at that experience, it's already 30 years past. We are still here discussing you know, relatively along similar line. That is what would happen. Uh, and what what is each side of position? Uh, so so it seems like it, it will continue at least from this morning's discussion uh, for number of years for years. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I guess from Beijing, like I mentioned earlier, from Beijing perspective, uh, that there are also uh, uh, pressing hope that. Uh, that might be a breakthrough uh, during Ma's second administration. But of course, like also everybody mentioned here, is unlikely to happen, but there is still hope. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Bonnie, let me speak to the issue of PRC tolerance about arms sales. I mean, it, ideally, Beijing would uh, prefer that we sell nothing to Taiwan and uh, that we have no security commitment uh, to Taiwan um, because in their view that would uh, improve the chances for um, successfully negotiating unification on Beijing's terms. Um, uh, Taiwan has a different view of the connection between the security relationship and um, negotiations, but that's a different issue. Um, but uh, in, in the real world, arms sales um, exist and will continue. Uh, it's hard to know what uh, governs Beijing's reaction at any point in time. Uh, there are political circumstances that um, uh, affect its response um, on each occasion. Uh, I think it's fair to say that um, Beijing objects most uh, to systems uh, that give Taiwan the ability to strike targets uh, on the mainland, um, such as um, advanced fighter aircraft and submarines. I would just um, add one point on the issue of Beijing's 
policy toward uh, Taiwan, I really think that the most important variable is whether or not the mainland continues to see time on its side. And I think it's very interesting if we you know, link together some of these issues that were talked about in the first panel and this panel, that the mainland is quite aware of the fact that support for reunification in Taiwan, as demonstrated in the polls, is actually declining. And yet I don't think it has lost confidence that time is on its side. And if I would venture to say that if a DPP president were to come back to power, that China would not instantly conclude that time is not on its side. After all, they survived eight years of a DPP president. So it would be interesting to try to tease out this issue of what would make Beijing actually change its assessment that time is on its side, because I think if they did, um, that that would be uh, a moment where we would see potential instability uh, in the cross-strait relationship. So if anybody wants to comment on that, um, we can do that after we collect uh, a few questions over here. Eric Lowe. Hi, Eric Look with the Fair Observer. Uh, my comment is basically, you know, like the 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 thing about, you know, like the, you just talked about, like what would make China lose patience. I think that the only thing that could make China lose its patience is basically, of course, a DBP president would be one of the things, but not exactly. But I think that how the U.S. react. I think that. Uh, Given from the, what the Chinese has been thinking of, it's more like you know, like Taiwan is part of them already in their in their estimation. Whereas anything that can change this kind of thinking would be a, a threat to their unification. I think that um, is is not playing to their hands that U.S. is not directly involved in 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 the talks or whatever is a good sign that is you don't see a kind of interference. So I don't think that would be a, 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 a situation that would uh, lead into a, a confrontation or something. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I have a question to three professors. Uh, I would like to know um, what's, what's the role of Taiwan in uh, U.S. rebalance uh, to uh, rebalance to Asia. And uh, is there some changes in U.S. policy uh, to Taiwan uh, after 2010? Thank you. Good question. Okay, we'll take one more from the back. Uh, Norman Fu, and with the China Times. Uh, it's been predicted that if Mayan Jew or Hu Jintao before and now Xi Jinping can achieve some kind of accord in the cross street, they'll both win the Nobel Peace Prize. So uh, I would like to uh, submit this question to the panelists, whether in your belief that Ma or Xi Jinping have that kind of burning desire to win the Nobel's Peace Prize. Uh, if that's the case, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Bush whether the United States, I know the U.S. policy, the policy is always we don't want to get involved because of the failure of the Marshall Mission in the mid-40s. Uh, however, the U.S. has been involved for the past century or so in the Taiwan Strait. So my question to Dr. Bush and perhaps even to uh, Ambassador Burkhardt, whether the U.S. would like to serve as a sort of a guarantor for the signing of such a peace accord, just like what Clinton did for the Oslo Accords between the PLO and the Israelis? That's my question. All right, we'll take that two finger if it's very short and then we'll come back to the panel. Gregory Ho from Radio Free Asia. Just a follow up on Lawman. Since China has already two uh, very important person got the Nobel Peace Award. One is Dalai Lama who is fed outside China. The second one is Liu Xiaobo who is still in jail. So my question is, uh, were China and Taiwan would eventually be united as a single nation. Can the Chinese leader 
get the Nobel Peace Award by the condition that there are two very uh, important Nobel laureates. One is fitting outside, one is still in jail. Thank you. I would hope that the goal here is to maintain peace and stability, not win the Nobel Peace Prize. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the floor over to our panelists who would like to start. Richard? Um, to uh, address Bonnie's question and Eric's about um, PRC impatience and uh, views of time, was whether, uh, whether time is on its side, I would speculate that uh, maybe um, it would reassess the situation if it decided that KMT intentions had changed. Uh, that uh, Guomindang leaders no longer held out the idea of unification at, at least as some sort of ultimate goal. Uh, that they were, as Beijing would define it, interested in two Chinas or one China, one Taiwan, and that was all. Um, on the role of Taiwan in um, U.S. rebalancing, um, um, first of all, uh, it is a matter of record that um, uh, Secretary Clinton, in talking about U.S. policy towards Asia, referred to uh, Taiwan as an economic and security partner. Um, I would phrase it a little bit differently. Uh, I think that, um, uh, first of all, um, Taiwan is, if you will, a, an implicit beneficiary in the U.S. rebalancing policy because I think the heart of that is uh, to maintain our uh, presence in East Asia, uh, economic, military, diplomatic, and so on. And uh, I think that uh, contributes uh, to Taiwan's welfare. Um, I think also Taiwan is an implicit contributor to uh, U.S. goals uh, because uh, it believes in uh, peaceful resolution of disputes, uh, following international law, and expanding areas of cooperation. On uh, the Nobel Peace Prize questions, I, I have no idea what the Nobel Committee would do if uh, there was some kind of grand bargain. Um, on Norman's question, um, uh, having to do with guarantors, uh, first of all, it's a, uh, quite a hypothetical question, but I guess the threshold issue is, would Beijing, which regards this as an internal issue, want an external party to be a guarantor, uh, United States or anybody else? I, I think I doubt that. Thanks. The... Uh question whether and when Beijing would lose uh, patience. I guess e essentially uh, uh, this just different format of another kind of question that is uh, when China would use military force. Uh, uh, this question uh, has been discussed many years, like I mentioned earlier, even during the era of Deng. Uh, I remember uh, at least at one occasion there, there, there there are sort of four conditions, uh, if I can, uh, uh, my own understanding, summarize into eight Chinese characters. Uh, that is, Tai Du, Wai Li, Nei Luan, Jiu Tuo. That is, the first Tai Du is Taiwan independence, and second, Wai Li is external forces intervene, and thirdly, Nei Luan, internal chaos. And then the last one, Jiu Tuo, is uh, last for a long, long time without uh, the any sign of unification. So, what about I, He Wu Qi? And also early, there is another one, Soviet Union. You know, the different occasion, different, you know, whether Taiwan would approach Russia. And, but I guess that's no longer. Because He Wu Qi already under control of the United States. Nuclear weapons, nuclear which was weapons. raised at uh, one time as a, right. as a potential um, precipitation of, a, of an attack. Uh, so I guess all of those uh, elements uh, may not, uh, I guess, e except the last one. Uh, but my understanding is that uh, uh, as long as uh, 
the sign is not really moving toward separation, uh, then uh, China still can can wait for that. But the question, of course, is is judgment. Uh, that's one reason for we early we talk about the Xi Ma summit. That is whether that would happen, and also mentioned uh, no bear. I guess the obstacle definitely seems like not from mainland part, uh, but is from Ma Yingju. Uh, we all understand the political constraints and others making Ma uh, very reluctant if if it's not impossible to open uh, his own way to to meet with a uh, mainland China leader. And that's turned to the question of U.S. position. Uh, I guess the just like any external powers, status quo would would be a pr preferred situation, you know, including United States and Japan. But at the same time, I guess both Washington and Tokyo uh, realize that uh, it's it's not that something they can totally control, just like a Korea Peninsula. If you ask a North Korea, South Korea, whether would prefer unification, all the major powers may not prefer that. But at the same time, they also understand that it's made, that's made beyond individual major powers control. It ultimately depends on the cross street people, whether they would like to achieve unification. Uh, responded to Bonnie's question, I, I think that the China's the, uh, the law passed in 2005, the anti-accession law, uh, it lists the three uh, conditions that it will use military or non-peaceful means to, to solve the Taiwan issue. That can be of uh, reference, although it's not a guarantee, but I think uh, uh, it's of reference. Uh, and my personal thing that uh, as only as, the, you know, uh, Taiwan's the economic reliance on China continue to increase. The, as long as the, the Thai, uh, United States, I'm sorry, uh, China can hold the strong the military capability to deter uh, Taiwan's the, you know, move to the uh, formal interdependence, I think that uh, China may not lose that patient uh, uh, in some of this uh, uh, di dispute. Uh, regarding the uh, Taiwan's role in, in U.S. The pivot uh, strategy, I think we can contribute to two things. First, uh, we help to stabilize the cross-strait relation. I, I think that's also benefit uh, to U.S. The interest in this area. And secondly, through the uh, you know excessive uh, uh, interaction between Taiwan and China, we have to change uh, China's the, you know view uh, on political democracy. Um, uh, and, and uh, is the modernization uh, process. I, I think we can contribute partially to, to change the China's development to move toward a more liberal and democratic uh, direction. I think that's the Taiwan's role that can play in U.S. strategies. Thank you. Yes, I recall President uh, George W. Bush once said that Taiwan is a beacon of democracy. Um, I think we have a few more minutes if we'd like to take a few more questions up front. Thank you, Bunny, and thank you all the panelists. I just would like to go um, make a short comments on the earlier points. Uh, Please in in introduce yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. You. I'm Bang Yu. I'm with Taipei Representative Office. Uh, in Professor Zhao's uh, remarks, you mentioned that. Uh, Cross Straits may uh, seek more cooperation, maybe in security uh, area, for example, South China Sea or East China Sea. And the last question from uh, previous panel also asked about whether Taiwan and China may line up on uh, East China Sea issue. I just would like to clarify that from the very beginning, um, Taiwan has taken very different approach from uh, Men in China's approach. And uh, we are very firm on our uh, sovereignty claim on East China Sea or Diao Yu Tai. Uh, but also, we also believe that uh, we can shelve disputes. And uh, we also hope that the concerned parties can uh, take peaceful approach on this issue. Therefore, uh, in Aug last August, uh, my government proposed the East China, C East China Sea Peace Initiative. And recently, actually earlier this month, we just um, 
signed uh, fishery agreements with uh, Japan. So that all shows we have been taking very different approach from Ben in China, and uh, we are firm on the peaceful approach. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Nadia? Hi, uh, Nadia Chow with the Liberty Times. And uh, Richard, I have a question for you. Uh, today you mentioned you know, unsymmetric capability again, and in your book you said that the U.S. should consider to help Taiwan to develop its missile. So I wonder, can you elaborate? What do you think, you know, uh, what would you suggest in here uh, for the unsymmetric capability Taiwan could have? And some people in Taiwan believe, like uh, Frank Shea and Anna Lu two weeks ago, believe Taiwan is going to face a uh, Mount um, you know, daunting challenge ahead is a strategic risk and challenge. But some people also believe it, that Taiwan has a you know, strategic opportunity in the near future. I wonder, well, you know, the panelists, what's your assessment? Thank you. Okay. Um, boy, there's lots of hands. We'll just take one final one, the woman right there. I'm Shiren Shen. I'm starting my PhD in political science at Stanford this fall, where I'll be focusing on China. Um, so um, I think Dr. Bush has mentioned there is like a Bandman theory like in the U.S., even though it's not like mainstream like thinking that, oh, Taiwan is pursuing further ties with, with China and like trying to alienate itself from the U.S. And on the Taiwanese soil, there's also an Bandman theory because like a lot of people think that, oh, the U.S. is actually pursuing further ties with China and it's not to be trusted. So could you like comment on, say, like, the Taiwanese leadership's perception of its, well, or its confidence in, like, the U.S.-Taiwan alliance and whether it actually provides an incentive for it to, like, pursue further ties with the mainland. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, one additional point that I'd like to throw out, if, if any of our three panelists would like to comment on, uh, uh, Frank Sia from the DPP has been talking about this Siemfa uh, Gubia, uh, or different interpretations of constitutions. And uh, if anybody could comment on what implication that might have for the cross-strait relationship and whether this might be acceptable uh, to Beijing as a basis uh, for going forward, even though, of course, other DPP members, including the party chairman, has not yet stated whether this would be uh, acceptable for him and for the party. All right, so uh, let's, uh, why don't we start at the other end again. Richard? Um, just briefly, because we're running out of time. Um, on the question here about abandonment, um, uh, the United States has been uh, improving ties with uh, mainland China, um, you could say, since the 1950s, uh, slowly but surely. And uh, Taiwan is al always worried about being abandoned, but it never happens. Um, and um, uh, I think what's I important is, you know, what the mainstream view is and what U.S. interests are. Um, I, I think my perception of the Taiwan leadership's view of this is that it, it remains uh, convinced that the United States uh, is a very important factor in um, sort of Taiwan pursuing its own interests uh, and will continue to be so. On the military question, um, I th let me clarify on the uh, issue of, of missiles. Uh, the important thing here um, for the United States is whether uh, Taiwan's uh, development of missiles uh, remains or is with, within the parameters of the missile technology control regime. Uh, I mean, that's the key variable. Um, I think that, in general, the sorts of capabilities that um, at least I'm talking about when uh, I use the words asymmetric and uh, that uh, it, it's capabilities that make it increasingly difficult or very difficult for the PLA to take the island of Taiwan. Um, on... Did I get them all? Um, what was your question? Oh, um, I'll, I'll just uh, repeat my um, that I have an allergy towards uh, any attempt to address complex issues with four character expressions. <laughs> e even Joar <laughs> Gongshi. I won't. I won't put you on the spot.
okay, I just want to quickly respond to Bonnie's uh, uh, questions. The, from my understanding, I, I think that uh, Frank Shea's uh, uh, pro pro uh, proposal uh, probably cannot repress the, the so-called 92 consensus the, in uh, pursuing the cross-strait uh, relation uh, for two reasons. First, uh, I think that the, even the DPP has no consensus about uh, that term and uh, what does that constitution represent, which means 1949, uh, uh, the constitution before 1949 made in, in, in China or that constitution amended uh, after 1991 uh, in, in Taiwan. Uh, which has different meaning the, about the, 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 the boundary of sovereignty of, of uh, uh, our sea. Secondly, uh, using uh, a constitutional consensus to re repress the 92 consensus, from my understanding that Beijing have no interest because the, it would lack the word one China. Uh, the 92 consensus at least have the you know one China with different uh, interpretation, uh, but they use the constitutional uh, uh, consensus, the, uh, the one channel words that will be, you know, uh, wiped out from, from those uh, phrases. I am afraid that uh, Beijing will conce consider that, uh, you know, uh, re re recession from the Taiwan's the previous position regarding these issues. So, so I think that uh, my, my, my personal opinion is that uh, uh, it, it may not, uh, uh, you know, uh, contribute uh, uh, better than the 92 <coughs> consensus. Thank you. Yeah, again, uh, start with Bonnie's question, uh, Frank Xie. Uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, Frank Xie's statement not regarded as official DPP position, uh, but DPP actually tried to dismiss any, including his uh, so-called private visit to mainland China. Mm -hmm. So in that case, uh, uh, may not expect that China really taking that seriously as a DPP position. Having said that, uh, anything depart from uh, total independence from China, uh, any uh, individual, uh, and not to mention Frank Xie's high position under Chen shui uh, administration, would be welcomed. Uh, so I would uh, think uh, it's it's a positive sign from, and that's also reflect uh, uh, PRC uh, making uh, uh, effort to reach out with the DPP and try to reach some uh, understanding. And and the question from uh, uh, Tekor, I forget your name. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. That is, even though uh, both uh, Beijing and Taipei. Uh, regarded uh, the Diao uh, Yudao, uh, uh, Sankaku, is part of Chinese territory. Uh, you know, of course, when you say Chinese, you, you can say so-called Greater China or only Taiwan. Uh, but that's, that itself is different from Japan's position. Because Japan uh, regarded uh, Sankaku Diao Yu as Japanese sovereignty and position. Uh, so I, I think even though you emphasize the difference between Beijing and Taipei, uh, but to me, fundamental, fundamentally, in terms of sovereignty uh, position, uh, there are overlapping, there are similarities. Don't forget Ma Yingju's uh, dissertation at Harvard Law School, right? <laughs> and he made that very clear, it's not part of, but of course, the, uh, uh, the East, China Sea peace agreement, uh, peace Initiative. proposal uh, is, is a, a welcome move in terms of as long as insist that's a uh, not Japanese sovereignty. But now, having said that, I, I do think the recently reached fishery agreement, uh, Beijing has certain suspicion that uh, not necessarily toward Taipei, but rather toward Tokyo. That is, that's an effort from Japan's side to really uh, separate Beijing and, and Taipei so, uh, so that the two sides could not have so-called united front uh, facing Japan. 
Well, thank you. This has been an excellent uh, panel. Um, and uh, before we, uh, we thank all of our speakers again, uh, I'll just mention lunch is in the back. We're going to have Ambassador Raymond Burkhardt as our speaker after everybody gets their food and sits down probably maybe about 15, 20 minutes. So again, please join me in thanking our speakers.